Today it is Resurrection Sunday. I like calling it that term. You can use whatever you want. But Resurrection Sunday is really what occurred. Christ rose from the dead. Whether it was this day or dawn, I don't know. I don't care. It's just a day we celebrate the event of Jesus rising from the dead. So I want to ask you a question this morning. I want you to think about it. You don't have to answer it out loud. But what does Resurrection Sunday or Resurrection Day or Easter, whatever term you want to use, what does it mean to you today? I'm not asking you what, did, what were you told it means. Because as a kid, we were told, you know, it was a day Jesus rose from the dead, whatever. No, what does it mean to you right now sitting in this room this morning or watching on video? What does it mean to you? Because I know over the years that the meaning has changed a little bit. You know, the more mature I get, the older I get, each year it seems to have a little different meaning to it. Personal meaning is what I'm talking about. For me, so, as I said earlier, I just got a couple things I want to share this morning. It'll probably be a little shorter. I don't know what it'll be, but... But the main focus of what I want to share this morning, it means victory. Resurrection Sunday means victory. There's a lot of victories in the book we can read. But the overall point is victory. But the first thing I want to share is it means victory over death, hell, and the grave. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 15. It was interesting as I was reading, like 55 to 58, I think it is, as I was reading through there and looking at the different translations of it, each translation had a great one verse in it. I couldn't find one translation that kind of said everything that was really awesome. So I kind of took each verse out of a different translation. But the first one's out of the voice translation in verse 55. It says, hey, death, what happened to your big win? I like that. It's almost like getting in death's face. Hey, what happened to your win? You know, what happened to your sting? Yeah, y'all cheering on Friday, weren't you? Y'all cheering when Jesus took that last breath, weren't you? Y'all cheering when they put him in the grave, weren't you? But hey, where's your celebration today? And we need to kind of grasp that point is, you know what? In the moment, things may not look good. In the moment, things might look like death. But you know what? Resurrection's coming. And you know how you speed up your resurrection in that thing? Is what you think about it, say about it, feel about it, how you handle it. Because again, so many people continue to talk death. They continue to talk the problem. What you say, you will strengthen. So if you keep talking about the problem or the situation, you're just going to completely embed yourself in that situation and there'll be no resurrection and you'll speak death to that thing. So I like this. It's almost trash talking, so to speak. You know, hey, death. How's it working out for you today? Not too good. Verse 56 says this, death gets its power to hurt from sin. And sin gets its power from the law. You know, we couldn't keep the law. You couldn't be good enough to win God's approval. Because in our natural state, we're sinners. We're born into sin. So we needed a Savior to come and save us and redeem us back to God. So Jesus had to die and suffer on the cross, shed his blood and die to pay our sin debt. That's what death got its sting from, from sin. And that's why I picked this point of victory over sin, death, and the grave. Because sin's been broken. Sin has no more power. Because it's got its power from the law, but Jesus, when he was on the cross, fulfilled the law. The law's been fulfilled. 
So we don't have to worry about trying to keep it, because we couldn't. Verse 57 says this, But thank God He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory over sin and death. You know what? People need to hear that today. The sin part they laugh at, but over death? You don't have to fear dying. So many people lived in fear this year, and, and that's my second point, so I'm not going to really push that right now. So many people lived in fear for a whole year. Fear of dying. Why would anyone want fear from dying? Why do you fear to die? See, that's what this day brings victory over, death. See, and as Jesse was saying earlier, the real fear comes from the place of judgment. Do you understand if you've been born in this flesh, if you are actually on this earth right now, you will never die. Because you were born spirit, soul, and body. You will never die. The only thing that's going to be determined is where you're going to spend all eternity. Because the soul never dies. Once you become born, you're never going to die. So that's not the issue. The question is where you're going to live. And what's going to happen when you stand before the judge? Because we certainly don't want to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. So the choice is ours. Do we want a relationship with God or not? See, he broke all that and opened up that relationship door so now we can enter in a relationship with Jesus Christ and make him our Lord. Because there's victory over sin and death. There's victory. And we can walk in that victory. And verse 58 in the Amplified Version says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It is never wasted or to no purpose. You're never wasting your time. You're never wasting your energies in service for the Lord. Never. And it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. Never. It says at the beginning again, stand firm, steadfast, and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I think I'll interject this here. We're having a conversation on the way in on... There's a lot of different kinds of Easter celebrations going on in churches this morning. A lot of different ways people are celebrating. And what I think we do sometimes is a disservice to our community is we portray Easter in a way it shouldn't really be portrayed. And sometimes we portray Christianity in a way it shouldn't be portrayed. And I mean it this way, if you're going to walk as a Christian, it's not going to be an easy life. It's not going to be all fun and games. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be trouble. One thing, when you make Jesus your Lord, you all of a sudden made an enemy, and his name is Satan. So I think we, we make it when we, when we display Christianity is... Well, I'll just say it this way. As only one side of the coin, we do a disservice. We need to let people know you need to stand and be unmovable, unshaken, steadfast in the things of God, knowing that you are in service to the Lord. Now, I never had the privilege of going into the service, but I've heard once you sign on the dotted line, you are now owned by the government. You are owned. You, are, you have no more life. You do exactly what they say you are to do. May I say it clearly, it's the same when you sign on the dotted line with the Father. And you make Jesus your Lord. He now has 
total and complete control over body, soul, and spirit. But the other side of the coin is you still have free will. You can choose to obey and disobey, just like in the service. You can choose to go AWOL. There are consequences for that service, I mean, for that decision. And I think what is a problem in Christianity is we don't understand when we go AWOL from God for a while, we don't see the ramifications of that decision right off the bat. Because God is long-suffering and He is caring. And He is trying to woo us back. But if we don't take the wooing, and all of a sudden we come to the end, there is no going back then. So we want to understand we're in service to the Lord. See, we have victory and freedom in order to do that. It's not laborious and it's not hard. And knowing it's not futile. It's not without reward. Because God knows everything you're doing. And He knows why you're doing it. Even if others don't. I don't know why he's bringing this to my mind, but I'll share it. When I do what I do now, when I share the Word of God here publicly, privately with others, for some reason God has given me the calling of kind of sometimes sharing a hard word. Well, most of the time, sharing a hard word. And I've been told because of that, that I'm uncaring and I'm unloving and I'm whatever. A whole gamut of stuff. I'm glad that God sees what other people don't. God sees my heart and the motive of my heart from where it's coming from. I never want to hurt anybody. But I view it this way, that I love you enough to tell you what you need to hear. Because if I don't say it to you, I don't know if somebody else is going to. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. If God's putting it on my heart to share it with you, I know he's opening up that door for you to hear that. Whether you choose to listen to it or not is up to you. And I'm saying that because I'm in service for the Lord and I'll be judged on whether I told you that or not. Because he said, look, it, I told you to tell him. I was working with him at that point. They were open at that point. But because for whatever reason you didn't share it, that door may close. So I want us to understand that and, and because I've come to grips with that, but sometimes maybe you are hesitant to say something God's putting on your heart for fear of whatever. And you still need to share that because you don't know the grand scheme and the big picture of things. God works in so many multifaceted ways. It's unbelievable. It's uncomprehensible. You're here thinking you're just talking with that individual on that one issue and you have no idea all out what else is going on. So he's given us victory over death, hell, and the grave. Provided all things we need for godliness. And to walk in victory so we don't need to fear death. We don't need to fear hell. We don't need to fear the grave. As long as we are walking in our path, understanding we are in service to the Lord. He's given us victory and freedom to walk in that. And the last thing is just victory over fear. He's given us victory over fear. You know, there was this meme going around on Facebook for a while that and it still is, I've seen it numerous times now, but it literally says this, it has been a year since most of you became afraid of dying, but in reality you wasted a year being afraid of living. Really did. Like I said, a year ago we weren't here. And we won't get into all the dynamics of that, but I want you to reflect on the past year. Were you more afraid of dying? In fear of dying, or were you in fear of whatever? Why were we in fear? Because Resurrection Sunday gave us victory over fear. See, because what fear did, it 
radically changed people's lifestyle, thinking, behavior, attitude, and not for the good. I watched one video yesterday on, on Twitter, I think it was, and there was literally this woman walking around in a grocery store carrying a mask, harassing a guy, telling him to put it on. They didn't know each other. She didn't work for the store. He didn't work for the store. Just a customer took it upon themselves to harass another customer in a store. And even when the guy was gracious enough, turned around, said, look it, I got an issue, I can't wear one. He even said what the issue was. She didn't care. And just went around. That's what I mean. This is what fear has turned people into. That's why this world needs Jesus and we're the hope of the world. We need to share with them you do not need to live in that kind of fear because I bet you a year or two ago that woman never would have done that to that guy. She would have been shopping, he would have been shopping, and it would have been no big deal. But that's what fear is turning people into. It's turning them into something that they are not and it's certainly turning, into the, turning them into something God never created them to be. Because fear causes irrationality and causes you to respond and react in a way you never thought you would. See Luke 24, look at, I'll read a couple of stories of the disciple. This was after resurrection Sunday morning, this is Sunday night. In Luke 24, 34 to 36 to 43, excuse me, when Jesus appears to the disciples, it says, while they were still discussing all of this, Jesus suddenly entered right in front of their eyes. He appeared right in front of their eyes, excuse me, startled and terrified. Now that's understandable. If Jesus just showed up right now, physically standing right there, some people would be freaking. I'd probably be freaking. Because it's not natural. They just watched Jesus die and get put in the grave. And now he shows up. So yeah, you're going to be startled and terrified. The disciples were convinced they were seeing a ghost. Standing there among them, he said, be at peace. That's critical, guys. Whenever fear starts to well up, we need to hear that still small voice on the inside say, be at peace, chill, calm down, relax, it's all good, whatever works for you, however your vocabulary goes. But Jesus immediately said, be at peace. Do you know you're supposed to walk through life every day and every moment of every day in peace? We're supposed to live in peace, in joy of the Holy Ghost, every moment of every day. So Jesus recognized they weren't in peace anymore. He says, hey, be at peace. He says, I am the living God. Do you understand, if you are born again, you have the living God living in you. You can walk in peace at all times, never being fearful of anything. Then he goes on and says, don't be afraid. Why? Because fear knocks you out of peace. That's why it's so devastating to live and walk completely and totally in fear all the time. Not only that, not only the stress it's putting on your body to be in fear. And then in verse 38, Jesus asks him, he says, why are you frightened? See, that's why we need to do that from time to time. Whenever you find yourself in a situation, you say, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Okay, I'm in this situation and I'm fearful. Whatever it is, ask yourself why. Why am I afraid? He says, don't let doubt enter into your hearts. That's what brings fear is doubt. That's what brings fear in our lives is doubt. <laughs> I don't want to say that. Okay. Yeah, I know, I fear you more. <laughs> we, were, we were watching last night between basketball games, the Bible was on, I forget the History Channel or something, but it happened to be when Jesus, um, a leper came, and everyone's freaking out. Jesus sees the leper, 
and he walks up to the leper, and I don't remember the, the engagement, but Jesus looks at the leper and says, be clean. He puts his hands on his face. And I immediately turn to Robin and say, yeah, listen, all them Christians today saying if Jesus was here, he'd wear a mask. He's touching a leper. Why? Because he was at peace. And he had no fear. And he had no doubt in his heart. And I'm saying that because that's how we're supposed to live as his kids, as physical beings with the Spirit of God living in us, just like the, he was a physical being with the Spirit of God living in him. He could walk in peace and have no fear and meet the person's need right where he's at, not even thinking about himself at all because he was in no fear. He had no doubt. And that's why we hesitate, and that's why we don't do, because of fear and doubt in our hearts. He said, why are you afraid? Don't let doubt enter your hearts. He says, see my pierced hands and feet. See for yourself that it is I standing here alive. Touch me and know my wounds are real. A spirit does not have a body of flesh and bone as you see that I have. Then he showed them his pierced hands and feet and let them touch his wounds. And the disciples were ecstatic, yet dumbfounded, unable to fully comprehend it. I get it. I mean, we're, in the natural, it's hard for us to comprehend, fully comprehend spiritual things. But they were still ecstatic. They were still excited knowing that they were still wondering if he was real, Jesus said, here, let me show you. See, he knew they were still wondering. He said, give me something to eat. And they handed him a piece of boiled fish and some honeycomb, and they watched him eat. So you know what? God will show himself real to you if you need that. He'll show himself real. God, I need, to show, I need you to show up. I need for you to demonstrate your reality in this situation. I need your peace. I need your comfort. I need your wisdom. Whatever it is. But you can't be in fear through doubt that he'll actually give it to you. That's why if you keep walking around saying, I'm nothing but a scummy worm, how are you going to have the confidence to go before the throne of God boldly in your time of need and get what you need from him if you don't see yourself as being acceptable in that fashion? You didn't make yourself acceptable. He did. He's called you righteous. He's called you just. He's called you perfect. Walk in what he has called you without any fear. <laughs> really? He wants me to tell you this other story before we read the last verse. Kind of give you a couple wrap-up verses to take home. I don't know if you saw it, too. There was another video I saw on Twitter last night. Was, um, it was in Canada, and the, the police showed up at this church. And that preacher run them guys out. They wanted to come in and disturb the... Is it Friday night? Friday night service that they were having. They came in because people weren't wearing masks. You gotta wear masks, it's the law. That preacher walked right up. Man, he called them devils. He called them Nazis. He was up in there. He ran them out. I mean, they backed down and they went out. And it's like, yeah, stand. When all else fell, stand. It's not being rude and ignorant, we've come to the place in society where nothing is sacred anymore. There's things that people do today that they never would have thought of doing just 10 years ago. Certainly when I was a kid, they never would have thought of it. We were just talking driving in how we remember back when on Sunday everything was shut down. And we're driving to church looking at all these stores open and stuff. It's like nothing is sacred anymore. This is the most holy day this is supposed to be the most Christian nation in the entire world. And Resurrection Day isn't even holy anymore. Why? We need more Polish preachers like that guy, because he was a Polak. <laughs> I found that out afterwards. Said, yeah, man. And get them Polish folk riled up. <laughs> 
especially after you had some kielbasa. Forget it. Woo! But see, don't be afraid. Please don't misunderstand that story. What he was doing was standing up for what was right. We are here to worship our God. We will worship our God. And nothing's going to stop worshiping of our God. Because he even told him, get off the property, come back later with a warrant. You want to come back? We're here. You're not going to interrupt this holy moment that we are having with God right now as an assembly, worshiping and serving God together. You want to come back later? Come back later. You will not disrupt it now. And he run them out. No fear. See, John 20, 19 and 23, this in the Amplified says this. So when it was evening on the same day, this is just John's account of the same thing we just read. The first day of the week, though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors for fear of the Jews. They were in fear of the Jews. Why? Their Savior, their soon coming King, they were, however they viewed Jesus, get killed, put in a grave. And now they're like, uh-oh. They're in fear of the Jews. I should say the Pharisees, religious leaders, we could say today, the religious establishment and government. They're in fear of that because of the events that just happened. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace to you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with great joy. Then Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Now notice what he says. As the Father has sent me, I am also sending you as my representatives. See, this isn't just a day of celebration. This is a day of commissioning. They didn't just celebrate the resurrection there. They weren't just excited. Jesus says, okay, here I am, guys. Now I'm sending you. And the only way you're going to function in being my representative is you must get victory over fear and be at peace. He said, and he said to them this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you understand God gave you a comforter to be in peace at all times? The indwelling Holy Spirit this wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And probably when we would say in our vernacular, they were born again right then and there. Then they said, go hang out in Jerusalem until you receive the baptism. See, Jesus commissioned them, but they were not even in full service yet until they became born again and filled with the Spirit of God. And that's why a lot of people are running around fearful and afraid because they're not filled with the Spirit of God. Oh, they are, and they're working on old oil and old fire. The fire's gone out. We need a fresh infilling and a fresh stirring of the Spirit of God. Then he says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven because of their faith. And if you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained and remain unforgiven because of their unbelief. Again, this reminds me, we're the hope of the world. If you don't share the good news with somebody, they remain in sin and unforgiven. How are they here without a preacher? doesn't mean someone who got the title. We're all preachers. We're all representatives. He says, as the Father has sent me, guys, I'm sending you all. And you go out in peace. Doesn't mean you'll be at peace with everybody. Live in peace whenever possible, it says. But as he showed me, you've got a sickle in one hand and a sword in the other. Because you have a harvest that needs to be reaped and an enemy that needs to be defeated. And you walk around with both. So let me give you the takeaways. How do you achieve victory over death, hell, and the grave? Again, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we've been talking about this. Test yourself and make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not hearsay, that Jesus is in you. Do you have firsthand evidence? 
Not because somebody told you he was in you, not if, because somebody told you if you pray this certain prayer or say these certain things he's in you, but you know that he's in you because his spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are now a child of God. If not, do something about it. Because without that, you will not have victory over death, hell, and the grave. How do you achieve victory over fear? Romans 6, 9 and 11 says this. I'll give you two verses here as so we wrap it up. Please, Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear what you have for the church to hear this morning. And we know that since the anointed one has been raised from the dead to die no more, his resurrection life has vanquished death. And its power over him is finished. For by his sacrifice he died to sin's power once and for all, but he now lives continuously for the Father's pleasure. Verse 11 is the key. So let it be the same with you. Since you are now joined with him, you must continually view yourself as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. We're not here for our pleasure to do our own thing. When you sign on the dotted line, you are owned. I am not going to sugarcoat Christianity. You are to serve at the master's pleasure, but his pleasure becomes your pleasure, and you do it in joy and excitement, and he uses you to do amazing things. It's not you serve him, you work with him. You are co-laborers working together to bring in the harvest. It's awesome. He's not your boss as in a natural sense. You work with him, alongside him, because you are in union with him. And lastly, in, in Isaiah 41.10, fear not. This is in the Amplified Version. There is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Why would you fear anything knowing God's with you? Know why? You don't think he's with you. So if you could at least get this revelation that wherever you go, if you've tested yourself, you have first-hand evidence that the Spirit of God lives in you, he is with you wherever you go. And he's already conquered sin, death, and the grave and fear because he didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So in whatever situation I find myself, I can be at peace. I don't have to be at fear. I can look death in the face and say, hey, death, do some trash talking with death. Where's your sting, buddy? Come on, bring it. Is that all you got? Come on, death. Sin, is that all you got, really? Man, you tried that on me 30 years ago. Man, you've been using that same old playbook for 30 years. When you understand, that's gone. Nothing. He says, do not look around you in terror and be dismayed. Stop looking at things with your natural eyesight and allowing that to stir you up and mess you up and get you out of faith. He says, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and harden you to difficulties. I'll harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of righteousness and justice. Don't look around and be dismayed. I'll give you this last story. When we were watching, watching the Bible, it was the incident where the disciples were in the boat and a storm was going. And Jesus comes walking on the water. And Peter yells out, you know the story, Lord, is that you? He says, if it's you, bid me to come. He says, come on out. And it was interesting because you see Peter get out of the boat and he kind of like touches his toe in the water. And then he steps on it. He's like, wow. 
And he takes like two steps, and then all of a sudden there's this crack of thunder and lightning, and he turns and he sees this big bolt come down, and as soon as he did, he started to sink. Why? He took his eyes off Jesus. He got distracted with the natural. He got distracted with what was going on around him. Get out of his peace. And he started to sink. And everyone in the boat's freaking out. First they were like freaking out because he's walking on the water. Then they're freaking out because he's sunk. And Jesus walks over and simply reaches down and pulls him up. And we know the story. He says, where was your faith? See, all the devil can do is distract you with stuff. And you know what? I keep telling you, every year I get older, all that stuff that I thought was so big in my 30s and my 40s, Guess what? I'm still here. No, I, I allowed this stuff to distract me, take my attention, take my focus, probably many times rob my faith and get me out of peace, cause me to walk in doubt. So today's a day of victory over death, sin, and the grave. If you haven't made Jesus your Lord, will you today... It's not a magical prayer. Just forgive me, Lord. I'm a sinner. I make you my Lord. Come in, live within me. But not only that, will you finally break fear? You get victory over fear. You have to fear anything. There's nothing to fear. Isaiah 43.10, go get it. Memorize it. Do whatever you're going to do. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. Take you by my right hand. That's how I memorized it years ago in my first church when I got really fearful over something. And he gave me that verse way back then. Fear not. I'm with you. If God's with you, who can be against you? They'll come against you. It didn't say they won't come against you, but who can be against you when God is with you? And he's in you, and he's given you all things. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen? Father, thank you for the victory that this day represents. Father, you're looking for a people that will stand in these last days. Stand in victory. Stand in boldness. Not for boldness sake. Not to get their own will and way but truly demonstrate your heart, Lord. Truly stand for your kingdom, for your principles, for your word, and not back down. And stand unashamedly that we will not be moved. So, Father, as we continue to celebrate this day throughout the day, however that looks and manifests, Lord, continue to be with us, speak with us. May we not lose focus on the meaning of the day whatever that means to us. But today, Lord, you've reminded me it's a day of victory, a day of celebration, a day of being ecstatic, as we just saw in the word. You're alive. Never to die. And because I am in union with you, the same thing that pertains to you pertains to me and pertains to all of your kids that we will live forever, that we can walk in victory, that we can be truly be overcomers. We can be walking on top of the water as long as we keep our eyes focused and stayed upon you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We worship and praise you now in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Be blessed. Enjoy.